my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop with another shop talk. I think this is going to be a fairly short shop talk at the moment because I don't have a lot of content prepared. But you know how that goes. I might get on a roll and this thing could be the longest one ever. You just never know. First thing I want to do is straighten out something that I confused in the last shop talk. And that is when I said something about our rental retreat being ready to rent out, I told you to send an email to Melissa. Well, that was really dumb on my part because it's you can sign up for it right there on my website. So just go to the website, uh, rosastringworks.com is the website. And then under the for sale slash rent tab, you'll look down and I think the very first thing on there is the rental retreat. You can sign up for it right there. There's a uh, it'll take you to a Facebook page where you can fill out the forms and stuff and we will we'll get back in touch with you and let you know what the details are and all that. So, very easy to sign up for the rental retreat. It is available. It is uh up in really nice shape, uh perfectly clean and neat and a lot of it's very new so I think you'd have a good time if you wanted to come out here and uh, spend a couple of days. Uh, we already know there's a number of folks that are starting to uh, rent it so uh, you might want to get in on it fairly quickly otherwise uh, your date might be taken. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, a tip. We're going to start off with a tip right up front. And the tip is uh, about gluing and gluing technique more than the kind of glue. As you all know, for the most part, when it comes to wood, I typically use Type Bond Original. Now, all of the Type Bond products are fine. Uh, you can use any of them and you should get good results. But you know, on instruments typically you uh, may need to take them apart at some time down the road. So the Type Bond Original is excellent for anything where you may have to take it apart down the road. More permanent Type Bonds uh, are fine, say like if you're gluing uh, binding strips together. Those would be excellent, like Type Bond 3 would be excellent choice there. Type Bond Original is plenty adequate, but if it's like a crack, you could use Type Bond 3 because you don't ever want that crack to open up again, and Type Bond 3 is pretty darn good. Okay, but now, the technique is really what I was going to talk about. The technique is, you know, I don't really have to demonstrate it too much, although I'll just use a couple of blocks of wood here just as a demonstration. What I see a lot of times, especially on instruments that come in here where we need to fix something where someone else has already tried to fix it, it's the same mistake over and over and over again as uh, Yogi Berra would have said, uh, deja vu, all over again. Well, what the mistake is, is people see a very tiny crack, like say like that, where it's just a little tiny crack. And they squeeze glue down in there and they think because the glue is all coated inside there and it's coating both surfaces, yet there's still a little bit of a crack there. They figure, well, it'll dry up hard and it'll be fine. It, and, you know, to a certain degree, that's true. Uh, it will dry up hard and it may be fine for a long time. It might even last several years. But eventually, eventually that joint's going to fail. And if, especially if you're talking about something that's really important, like a neck joint, or if you're talking about uh, you know, a, a structural point on the top like a brace or on the back like a brace, you do not want to just let, it, you know, let the glue hold it. That's not where glue gets its strength. Now, I'm not a chemist and I can't tell you all the physics behind it. I just know from experience. If you leave any kind of crack, even if it's just a hair crack, and you put glue in there, it's going to fail eventually. So what you need to do is you need to squeeze all of the air out of there. You need to get it glue and surface to surface. And you need to clamp it really well. Um, you know, there's that old controversy that pops up all the time. You're going to squeeze all the glue out of the joint. No, you're not going to squeeze all the glue out of the joint. In fact, if you can, you'd probably be doing better. Um, but you want to squeeze it really good and tight. You want surface-to-surface -surface contact pretty much, and uh, you'll be good to go then. Uh, you do want full coverage on all the wood surfaces. That's very important. 
So that's the technique I'm talking about, is making sure it's got full contact. You're wasting your time, really, to just squirt glue in there if you can't make full contact. So make sure that you can get full contact before you put glue in there. In fact, you might want to do a mock-up clamping uh, to test it. It's very important that the clamping be good. Okay, well, while we're on glues, let's just, you know, recap again. I've done this before, so this could be old. We're going to talk about the glues that I typically use again. And that, first of all, you know that I typically use the Tight Bond Original. That's what this is in this little glue bot that you see me use all the time. It's just because it's handy. But it is Tight Bond Original. They make it in three different flavors, I think. One of them is original, one of them is Type Bond 2, and then there's Type Bond 3. Type Bond 3, I think, is fully waterproof. So if you have a, you know, crack, or broken something or other, and you're really absolutely sure you never want it to come apart, Type Bond 3 is perfectly fine to use. I just typically use Type Bond Original because that's what I have here on my desk all the time, and that's pretty much what I use. However, uh, my friend John Manura from AccuSlice, check him out on YouTube, uh, used Type Bond 3 when he glued all those uh, binding parts together that he sent to me. He sent me binding and purfling, and I have to tell you, that held together really well, even when I soaked it and uh, heated it on the uh, bending iron and everything. So that Type Bond 3 is really good for binding and things like that. Okay, so that's the tight bond story. What, what other glues do I have here on my desk and why do I have them here? Well, I have CA glue all the time. CA glue is most useful for me for quick and dirty or where I can't clamp it. The one property or trait of CA glue that is incredibly uh, important is that it sticks to itself better than it sticks to anything else. <laughs> And so, I mean, it sticks to everything pretty well, don't get me wrong, but if you put it together and it fails, the advantage of CA glue is the next time you put it together, it'll probably hold because it sticks to itself really well. So the thing about CA glue is if you put it together and your joint fails, try it again and make sure you get it clamped well and all that, and uh, the CA glue will probably hold very well the second time. The next tip or trick about CA glue is the accelerant. Now, or the activator, they call it different things. But this is one I really do like, it's a good one. I'll just show it to you here. You can get this off eBay or wherever. This came from Woodcraft, it says. But that is a good one. I like the aerosol myself better than the pump. Although the pump's probably a little bit more accurate maybe or something, or in maybe a little less wasteful, I'm not sure. You don't need very much accelerant or, or activator, but the trick about using it for me is, is I, I always let the glue set for at least 10 seconds. You know, if you, if you can wait 10 seconds or so before you apply the accelerator, then you won't get that bubbling and that white, you know, where, where everything turns white and foamy. Um, people don't like that, especially on the look on their guitar, of course. And so if you just give it about 10 seconds or 15 seconds or so before you apply the activator, then you won't have that problem. Or at least I haven't experienced the problem if I wait that long. If I apply it right away, bingo, it gets hot real fast and, you know, it's all over. We've been using this superfatic glue quite a bit lately. Uh, it's a pretty good glue. It's a little thinner. Uh, it's kind of a cross between maybe CA glue and Type Bond. It's somewhere in there. Um, probably a little more Type Bond than it is CA glue, I guess. But it uh, it seems to hold a lot of different kinds of material, really, and it holds them pretty quickly. So like if you want to glue in a nut, for example, you, a, a drop of this on where you want your nut to go and hold it in place for, you know, a little while. And then maybe in 15 or 20 minutes, it may, or, you know, it might be ready to go where, you know, you could do CA glue and it'd be ready to go almost instantly. Don't get me wrong. But the problem with using CA glue is you got to be very careful because it will run everywhere and create all kinds of problems. Where this, you can clean this up. I water all the time. I, I don't think I've had any trouble cleaning this up. So that would be the advantage of this over the CA glue in, in uh, critical spots. 
We also, and I don't have any right now, but I did order some more canopy glue. Uh, I like canopy glue a lot. It's, um, it's, uh, I think it's called Canopy 529. I'm not really sure, but if you just type in canopy glue in eBay, you'll find it. The model airplane folks put me onto that in that they glue their plastic canopies on their planes uh, to their wooden models and it holds them really well. Well, you can apply that plastic binding to your wooden guitar and it holds really well. Uh, anything that can stand up to those kinds of wind pressures and forces that they have when they're flying those model planes, you know, it's going to be probably pretty good stuff and it does hold really well. I haven't had nothing but good luck with that stuff and it is water-based also so if you get it on your finished sides and things you can clean it right off. Every type of glue needs a good clean surface and a good made up surface so you know that applies to all these glues I'm talking about. These other glues I don't use very often but I use them once in a while and, and that would just be this white Elmer's glue. I use white Elmer's glue in two circumstances. Uh, one is I'm gluing a paper label in, I'll use this sometimes. But the more often when I use the white Elmer's glue is when I'm rehairing a bow. And you take all those hunks of hair and you have to retie it. And I put this white Elmer's glue right on the very tip end of those uh, pieces of hair, right on the tip then I take a flame and hold it on that and this glue swells you know because it's water-based it swells up the ends of those hairs and uh, when you heat it and everything it makes a nice real good joint knot so I use it for that all the time but a paper label is good and believe it or not before wood glues came out back in say the 60s or whenever this was a really good wood glue and it is a pretty good wood glue if this is all you happen to have uh, and you need to glue wood together, this does a pretty good job. So it's not that bad, really. Then I, I have some glue here that uh, this is just liquid hide glue, and it's really my go-to for gluing in paper labels, more so than the white glue. I like the liquid hide glue for, and you can spread it nice, and uh, then you put your paper label in there and it sticks it down really well. So I typically use that for my paper labels. I don't use much in the way of epoxy. Um, I typically on a guitar or a musical instrument in general, me personally, I'm almost totally anti epoxy. Uh, don't use it anywhere, really. The only time I use it is like, say, filling a, a large hole or void. Um, and I don't mean like I'm trying to glue two things together that have a void. I'm talking about like a hole. When I put a truss rod in a new neck I'm building, I'll, you know, like have everything else filled in and there may still just be a little hole there. Well, I'll fill that, it, that hole in with epoxy. That's about the only way I use epoxy is filling a hole. That's just my opinion. Everybody else can have a different one. I don't like epoxy hardly at all. I just don't really care for it. I, just a side track. Uh, I see people using JB Weld epoxy all the time and they just use it on the craziest things. And I've tried it on most of those crazy things they tried on, like fixing a radiator, you know, and I'm like, I haven't had JB Weld hold anything. Not one single thing I've put it on has it worked. About the only thing it would work for would be to fill a hole again. You know, I'd, I'd use it for that, but that beyond that, forget it. That's just my experience. Your results may vary. Okay, I have another glue here. And, you know, honestly, I'm trying to think of what... This is good glue. I like it. Um, it's uh, Gorilla Glue. This is uh, the clear Gorilla Glue. Um, it's got a different formula than their normal stuff. Um, it says it glues pretty much everything. This is... I think this one also says non-foaming. I'm not really sure. I thought I saw that somewhere once before, but... Maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't, yeah, it does say no foam. So this doesn't foam up like the other glues. But this clear Gorilla Glue is pretty good stuff when you want to glue weird stuff together. You know, I wouldn't necessarily use it normally on my instruments, and I typically don't. But if I have something that's just weird that needs to be glued together, and I can't think of anything right now, like maybe, you know, maybe in a case, maybe a piece of cardboard to some foam or to something else, I might use this. I, I'm just saying, I'm just talking off the top of my head. But this is a pretty darn good glue for weird stuff, is all I can tell you right now. I don't typically use it on the instruments, though. 
that's about it. I don't see any other glues laying here. And um, I hope you find my tip about making sure that you have good contact and good clamping. Uh, you know, there's been all kinds of back and forth banter on the internet about you're going to squeeze all, squeeze all the glue out and it won't hold. Well, I'm going to tell you for sure, I'll go to the point of squeezing the glue out every time before I'll leave even the slightest crack. If you really want strength, that's where it's at, is getting it clamped together. Hope you've enjoyed the uh, little segment here on glues and that tip about clamping. We'll see what else we can come up with for this shop talk. Okay, our dates this year for Mountain View are June 10th through the 13th. And so that means we'll be spending the night on Thursday the 10th, Friday night the 11th, Saturday night the 12th, and leaving on Sunday the 13th. So that's down in Mountain View, Arkansas. We jam around the town square there. They have some pavilions where you can jam under. And it's pretty much, you know, hit and miss. Uh, you, don't, you never know how many people are going to be there. You never know how many musicians are going to be there to jam with. But we always have a good time. And we always, or at least I do, I'm, all, I'm always getting a jam session going somewhere. So if you are available to come down there uh, in June and uh, meet up with us. We'd be happy to play some music with you, or if you just want to come and listen, that's perfectly fine too. We also go out to dinner as a group every once in a while, and we go down uh, to that catfish place, uh, JoJo's Catfish Place, I believe it is, off of the, uh, I believe it's the White River there that runs through by Mountain View. And that's only about a whole oh, eight or nine mile drive out of town. So uh, it's a really good place to eat. So we typically go out for that on a Thursday evening or sometimes a Friday evening. So if you can make it down there for that, you could go, uh, go eat with us too. Mr. Blackmore, Steve Blackmore sent me a picture of a jig that he built to hold a file at a angle. And what he uses it for is uh, angling the, the fret ends on, the, on his uh, fretboard. And this is a very tiny picture, but you can see it's kind of a wedge on one side and it's square on the other side. And so he's got a, you know, he's got a 45 and a square that hold that the fire file is held into. I'll, tr I'll try to find the the original picture of this and actually put it in the uh, video right now. The 12th string guitar that we're that I've been building, you've been watching the series on. It's still under construction, and I'm still putting finishes on it and stuff. The one bit of Unusual news is we've lost contact with that fellow. He was contacting us quite regularly for the first, you know, number of videos and uh, keeping in touch with us and stuff. And I've sent him a couple of emails and Melissa's been trying to contact him and we have not been able to get a hold of him. So if anyone happens to know that fellow over there in Scotland and knows who I'm talking about, I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't know if... Or, you know, and of course, if he's watching, he would know to contact us. This is the reason I'm mentioning. I don't wish any bad luck on him, but maybe he's in the hospital. Maybe he got COVID. I don't know, you know. So we're just uh, concerned, and I would just like to have him get in touch with us because uh, we do need to uh, talk about a couple of, of fine issues there as I'm finishing up the guitar. And one of those is about the pickup that he wants in there. So that's pretty much it on that front. Caleb, as I mentioned to you, is going to be deserting me like the old rat from the sinking ship thing, you know, down the road. <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. He's, but he does have his own YouTube channel now, and uh, he has put out a video or two out there. And uh, you can look those up on YouTube at just Caleb Mills. And that Caleb is C-A-L-E-B and then Mills, M-I-L-L-S. So if you just go on YouTube and search Caleb Mills, I'm sure you will find it. RSW t-shirts, get you some. They're on my website, rosastringworks.com, under the for sale tab. Another common problem that I see on instruments, and especially instruments with uh, adjustable and or just floating bridges, if you will, like on a banjo or on a violin or, uh, you know, some arch top guitars have bridges that move, float, and are, many of them are adjustable. 
Well, anyway, one of the main problems I see with them is keeping those bridges vertical. So here's a little segment that I filmed earlier that I'd like to, for you to take a look at. I thought I'd take an opportunity to include a tip in a shop talk on an instrument that is in for setup. And that would be this old Gibson mandolin here. And I say old, it, I don't think this is that old actually. Um, I don't really know what year it is, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, I wanted to tell you about this setup tip. The setup tip is the bridge leaning forward. Now it's still, if you know, if I'm being honest, it's probably still just a hair forward, but they lean forward quite a lot. And that's not just a Gibson, that's pretty much any mandolin on the planet uh, that has an adjustable bridge especially. But all instruments that have adjustable bridges including archtop guitars and you know banjos and everything that has a bridge that's loose or floating bridge is really what I should say. Adjustable makes it even worse but floating bridge, all floating bridges have a tendency to pull forward. Now why is that? That's because there's two reasons I would say physically. One of them is this steep angle. The, the, you know, because from the bridge you're going down to the tailpiece and there's a steep angle there and that angle as the strings are tightened, which is the second reason, as the strings are tightened, the strings are pulling the bridge forward and that angle helps push it forward also. So that those two things combined, the bridge barely stands a chance of being straight up and down. And I would say at least at least 80%, 90% of the instruments, mandolins especially, that I see, violins too, have their bridges pulled forward. Um, banjo's not quite as bad because there's not quite as much tension on the banjo strings, but uh, you know, a lot of instruments do it. Uh, banjos do it too because they're head, in addition, they have a third reason and that's because their head flexes a lot. So. The point is, the reason I'm bringing this all up is that you just have to, as a musician, learn to get your bridge straightened back up. And so let me just show you my technique on a mandolin here. This one's already been straightened, by the way, but I'm just going to show you the technique. And the technique is you grab, what I do is I put two fingers on each side of, of the bass, because the bass can slide on you and you don't really want the bass to move. And, and so like I've got my fingers and my thumbs on the base and then I take my two index fingers and I lay them over the top of the saddle like this and I pull backwards and it just helps straighten it up you know like so and this one's pretty straight but after years and years of leaning forward it's really hard to straighten them up sometimes you almost have to just take and turn your bridge around make the bridge fit the top again and put your saddle back on top of your bridge um, you know keep make sure you keep your saddle oriented in the proper direction all the time too like on a mandolin well, on almost any instrument, uh, the, e, the uh, high E strings or the high strings are uh, slightly forward of the bass strings. And so you can see the saddle is actually cut that way on a mandolin. So the, the E strings are slightly forward of the G strings. But anyway, the point being that you do want to pay attention to your bridge and you do want to keep your bridge straight up and down as you can. Well, for one thing, you can be playing, I've seen bass players especially, acoustic bass players that is, upright basses, and be playing and have their bridge just fall forward right on stage. You know, it just happens. It's because they don't pay attention to their bridge and keep it straight up and down. It can happen on a mandolin. I've really not seen it happen much live or anything on a mandolin, but it could happen on a mandolin as well because there is a lot of torsion on this. And so, and, and this technique I showed you, you got to be careful, I'm not going to lie to you, and you do have to use some physical force. You know, I don't mean to pick on the ladies, but the ladies might need some help. It's pretty, it's pretty stout, and if your fingers aren't fairly strong, you might not be able to straighten it up. So, uh, you know, pay attention to that and keep that as straight as you can keep it. Um, it, and, and almost every time you pick it up, you kind of need to look at that, really. It's, it's, it's pretty common. It's just something that happens on mandolins. It's, um, 
doesn't matter who made the mandolin, it, they all do it. So I hope you enjoyed that little tip there. I think that that is a worthy tip. And I think if you'll pay attention to that and keep your bridge straight up and down, you'll be a lot happier with the sound of your instrument because it does help put more tension straight down on the top too. And it does help the vibration and all that. So it's not just a looks thing. It's, it's, it's really a mechanical thing and it is also a tonal thing. So good luck with it. Hope you uh, are able to get your bridge straightened up. My friends, that's going to conclude today's shop talk. If you happen to have other ideas for topics on shop talks, put those in the comments because I do read the comments. If you have not yet subscribed, be sure to uh, click that subscribe button. And doggone it, click that thumbs up. We need all the help we can get. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yeah.